Hi everyone. Well, we've had functional February and mechanical March, and now it's time for analytical April, in which we're going to be focusing on languages that are great for data science. As you've come to expect uh, from the last few months, in this video, Eric and I are going to be giving you a quick overview of what this month's about uh, and looking at the different languages that we're going to be exploring this month. So hi, Eric. Hi. Um, so as normal, Eric's going to be talking us through the languages in a bit, but I'll start off by giving a few of the practical details of the month. Um, so firstly, the languages that we've got for this month, well, we've just got three, uh, Julia, Python and R. Uh, each of the languages is quite different. Obviously, Python is a very multi-purpose language. We could have probably put it in almost any, any month throughout, throughout the year. Um, but we're going to encourage you to try and use all of these languages with a, a sort of a data science mindset during this month. To get the analytical April badge, you need to complete five exercises in one of those languages. And we'll explore the differences between the languages shortly and try and help you understand which one's right for you. In exism terms, the Python track has got a fantastic syllabus, so I really recommend you try that out. We're also hoping to get a Julia syllabus launched during this month. A lot of the work for that's already done and it just needs a bit of polishing. R doesn't have a syllabus, but it's got loads of interesting exercises for you to play with as well. So your choice, but uh, that's a bit of an overview of how it looks exism. So we've got five featured exercises for you to try. The first is ETL, in which you can explore reshaping data into a different format. Then we've got largest series product, where you can look at uh, efficient ways of uh, looking for patterns in strings of digits. Then saddle points to explore working with multidimensional arrays and matrices. We've got sum of multiples to practice filtering and summation of a sequence of numbers. And then finally, word counting, which you can convert a string into words and then count them. And looking at different ways to do that efficiently. And a reminder that as well as the analytical April badge, there's a year-long 12 in 23 badge that you can get for solving the various featured exercises at any time during the year. So you'll need to solve the five exercises I just said in either Python, R or Julia sometime this year for those to count towards the badge. But if you want the analytical April badge, you've got to solve any five in those languages during April. And there is a, a forum post linked from the analytical April page which lists all of the exercises throughout the year that you need to complete. So finally, before we dig into the languages, a reminder that during March we launched our new Discord server. There's been loads of fun activity on there, so make sure you check that out. I'll put a link in the description below for that as well, but it'd be great to see you there and have some fun around analytical April. So let's explore the languages. Um, we're going to get a quick overview of each of the languages, just a bit about the history and what they're used for. Uh, and then we are going to dig into a few more questions about each one. So Eric, I'm going to be handing over to you here. Do you want to give us just a quick introduction to each of the, the three languages, maybe starting with Python? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, Python was conceived and developed by Guido van Rossum, a compatriot of mine, he's also Dutch. Um, it was built as a successor to the ABC programming language. It was first released in 1999. Um, it was developed in the Netherlands at the Centrum Wiskunde en Informatica, CWI, which is famous for where Eske Dijkstra has worked, which is, himself is famous for Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, it's a government-funded research lab, so Python is actually sort of like a research project almost, and it was uh, built because Guido had worked with C and shell scripts a lot, and he, he sort of liked bits of both. He liked that you could use C for almost anything and it was high performance, but with shell scripts, he had a lot of flexibility and its interpreted nature meant that it was easy to iterate on things and to explore new ideas. But he also felt that both languages had severe downsides. So he thought as a real programmer does, why not build my own language? And that became Python. So he wanted to get the best of the world of C with the best of the world of shell scripts. So, Python became an interpreted language that you could use for anything. Um, Python is also interesting in that it is managed by the Python Software Foundation and that any changes to the language go through a rather formal process called Python Enhancement Proposals, PEPs, which is something like uh, how RFCs work with uh, all the, the HTTP uh, RFCs. So that's Python in a nutshell. Nice. Uh, and R? R. Uh, R was created by Ross Ieka and Robert Gentleman of the University of Auckland. Um, R can be seen as a re-implementation of the S language. 
And the S language was developed by Bell Labs. It's a statistical uh, computing language. And S was succeeded by S+, but that was a commercial language. And both Rob and uh, Robert, uh, Ross and Robert felt like they wanted to have an open language that could do the things that S or and S plus could also do. So uh, it is great for doing statistical computing, but it's open as opposed to the S plus language. Um, as it is a re-implementation of S, of course, the syntax of R is very reminiscent of S, but interestingly enough, its uh, semantics are actually derived from Scheme, which is a Lisp and a functional language. So uh, quite an interesting thing there. Um, the goal was, of course, to create a language that is great for doing statistical computing, uh, but it should also be great in doing graphics, so plotting data. And it mm -hmm. should be easier to use than other languages because most of these other languages will have been developed by computer scientists and for different purposes, so not specifically for statistical computing. And they thought, well, the same thing that uh, Guido had, let's just build our own language because we think we can do better. <laughs> nice. This is a common theme that we're coming across with, uh, with languages. And then finally, um, Julia? Uh, Julia, yeah. Julia was developed by uh, four people initially. Jeff Bezanson, Stefan Karpinski, Viral B. Shaw, and Alan Edelman. And it was, uh, like our, an open project from the beginning. Um, its goal was to build a free, uh, open, high-level language that had, and then now comes a whole uh, boatload of different uh, aspects, the speed of C, the dynamism of Ruby, the metaprogramming of Lisps, general purpose skills of Python, statistic support of R, linear algebra support of MATLAB, and the string processing power of Perl, all whilst being able to perform well while being executed concurrently. So they try to pick the best of a lot of worlds here. Um, wow. R was uh, developed for, uh, Julia was developed for doing scientific computation, so that's where it really shines but it is a general purpose language, so you can do more with it than just scientific computing. So all, all three languages were basically built out of dissatisfaction with the status quo. I like, that, um, I like that Julia basically decided they wanted to just be the best of everything and just pull all the bits in. That's um, a good way of doing things. So in terms of the use cases of these different languages, when would you like use each of them? What's, where do they shine? Starting again, maybe with Python. Um, so, so Python is a true general purpose language. You can use Python for virtually anything you, you can think of. So you have TensorFlow with which you can do AI. Uh, you have NumPy for scientific computing. You can use it to build scripts, maybe to uh, install things on your servers and handle things remotely. You can build websites via Django. Uh, you can build embedded systems with MicroPython. You can interact with hardware, for example, Raspberry Pis often uh, our uh, interface with uh, Python code. You can even build games. So EVE Online has a Python core and Python even went to Mars on this little copter uh, device. So uh, you can use it for a ton of things, but it's also great to learn programming with. So um, Python is now often replacing other languages as the language of choice for universities to teach students to learn to program. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, We'll come to some of that later, but Python has um, nice syntax for uh, newcomers, but it also is a very popular and big language, which means that there's a wealth of resources available for students to use. Uh, the community is huge, so you can ask questions. Uh, you can basically find anything on Stack Overflow, I guess, for Python. Um, and there's uh, even a lot of guidance on how to write Python the proper way, which they call Pythonic code. So there are um, a set of documents that describe the Pythonic way to do code. So I, I like the example of explicit is better than implicit and readability counts. So these are goals that um, people that want to program Python in an idiomatic way, the Python way should keep in mind. So I quite like that. Uh, and another example of where Python is easy to get started with is that many of the Linux OSs have it installed by default. Uh, mm -hmm. Mac OS used to have it. I don't think it does anymore, but uh, it's all very easy to install. So um, it has a wide uh, install base. So yeah, the Python you can basically use for anything, I guess. Yeah, it's. I, I feel like it's a good language for everyone to learn just because it does, as you say, come up in so many different areas. And if you are interested in machine learning, your network side of things, definitely I think Python's a really important language to, 
be familiar with. There's such incredible tooling around that. It's become very much, as you said, the the de facto language to be doing uh, AI and neural de development in. So really good for that. Um, what about R? Where would you where would you choose to use R over Python, for example? Mm, R is used in a wide variety of places, um, but mostly where statistics are being uh, are very key to the domain. So um, there are mm -hmm. a lot of domains though that have this uh, property. So for example, researchers that analyze data, looking for a certain uh, if it's a significant uh, result, then they need to do proper statistical analysis of the data, and R is great for that and used all over the place. Um, many universities use R to teach statistics and data analysis, and the financial sector uses R a lot because statistics are key to a lot of uh, different aspects of the financial system. For example, insurance relies on it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Retail uses it, for, so for example, Amazon uses it to do uh, data analytics, and the manufacturer John Deere uh, uses R to uh, determine to estimate basically uh, how many spare parts they should produce. So uh, a lot of real yes. world usage there. Um, the National Weather Service uses R to help predict weather and disasters. Um, and there's also a thing called data journalism, which is where uh, journalists look at data that's out there and they analyze and see if there's information in it that nobody else has yet uncovered. And mm. part of the data journalism is also that you probably want to uh, visualize the data because that makes it a lot more appealing to your readers. And uh, R is also great for doing that. So it's excellent for data journalism too. Uh, and then finally, it's heavily used in healthcare. Uh, for example, when you have new drug trials and you have preclinical pre, pre trial results and you need to determine whether or not a drug is effective. So um, then you use statistics and R is perfect for that and used all over the place in the healthcare sector. I had no idea it was such a widely used and popular language. It's really interesting. Um, and then finally, what about Julia? Where would you use Julia? Yeah, Julia is, well, as I just described, it uh, was designed to be great for scientific computing. So mm -hmm. if you want to do data mining, machine learning, linear algebra, or distributed computing, Julia is perfect for that. And uh, this also helped for um, uh, its mathematical notation support. It's not a complete 100% equivalence, but it will feel very uh, similar to mathematical notation. So if you are working in a domain with a lot of math, then converting equations into Julia code feels fairly natural. Um, and Julia is fantastic for doing distributed computing. So um, this was one of the goals and they really achieved this. And uh, I'll give a, an example in a minute, but Julia is great for running things in parallel and have them communicate between uh, each other. So there's a lot of different places where Julia can be used that uh, require distributed computing. And mm -hmm. probably the best example is the Celeste project. Okay. Um, the Celeste project is a supercomputer and it runs Julia code to analyze 178 terabytes of astronomical data. So wow. a, a lot of data. And um, an interesting fact is that this uh, Julia being running on this supercomputer made Julia part of the Petaflop club, mm -hmm. which is um, the list of languages that have uh, been running in production where they process a quadrillion floating point calculations per second. And a wow. quadrillion is a one with 15 zeros. And at the time when Julia joined this club, only C, C++ and Fortran had achieved this. Mm -hmm. And um, Julia is actually a dy dynamic language, whereas the others are all statically compiled. Mm -hmm. So um, it's quite a feature for Julia to be in that list. Um, apart from the Celeste project, Julia is also used in CLIMA, which is the Climate Modeling Alliance, mm -hmm. which has people from um, all over the world, Caltech, MIT, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and other people. They develop a climate forecast model. Um, it's being used at CERN and at ASML, which is well a well-known chip uh, manufacturer. Cool. Um, I had no, no idea about most of that as well. That's fascinating. Um, so three, I guess, different use cases there, all in the sort of world of, of, of data science and scientific computing. But yeah, hopefully you can see where you would choose Python or Julia and which one is most interesting for you to pick from a sort of use case perspective. Thinking Eric, a bit more from a, a programming perspective, what do the languages look like to use from, from our perspective as programming? Are, are they dynamic static? Are they uh, functional, object-oriented? Maybe you can just give us a bit of an explanation with those, again, starting with Python. 
Yeah, sure. Um, Python is a dynamic language. It's strongly typed. Um, it's a multi-paradigm language, so you can do uh, imperative, procedural, and functional programming in Python. But at its core, it's really an object-oriented language. Mm -hmm. And this is evidenced by the fact that in Python, everything is an object. Classes, functions, modules, everything. So um, it is an object-oriented language with other paradigms that you can use, but uh, you should really know uh, that Python is at its core an object-oriented language to make the best use of it. Um, Python is often referred to as an interpreted language, and that's partially true. Um, so uh, in last month, we had everything compiling to machine code, but this month is different in that most of these languages will be interpreted or a variant of interpretation. So uh, let me explain what I mean by that, by that. So by default, the Python interpreter that you get is C Python. And what it will do is it will compile uh, Python to an intermediate form, bytecode. And then when you execute it, it will um, interpret that bytecode via a virtual machine. So that's uh, a completely different model from the machine code in uh, compiling language that we had last month. Um, there is a, an alternative to C Python, which is PyPy, which is also sort of popular. And, and it has a different strategy. It actually, um, it will interpret the bytecode and it will compile it just in time to machine code. So it doesn't do the virtual machine interpretation, but it will use a just-in-time compiler to compile to machine code. And it should get better performance than C Python in a lot of places. So this is why PyPy is uh, quite uh, popular. Um, it's a similar story for uh, Julia. So Julia is also dynamic and strongly typed. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have an interpreter, but it has the same just in time, uh, just ahead of time, uh, they call it. So they call it just in time ahead of time compilation, which okay. is a mouthful, but it basically means when, when you run your Julia code, um, when you execute a function, the, the Julia runtime will see that, hey, this is the first time that I'm executing this function. I haven't yet compiled it. So let me compile it before I'm gonna execute it. Mm. Um, and then um, subsequent function calls will just use the generated machine code. And this is what they refer to as a just-in-time, ahead-of-time compiler. Um, Julia is dynamic and strongly typed like Python, and it is also a multi-paradigm language. It is uh, a very functional language, so you have higher order functions, partial application, pipe operators, um, but you can also do imperative slash procedural programming in it, and there's also object orientation support although it is um, somewhat different from your uh, regular uh, object-oriented language, and we'll get to that later on. Then there's R, and R is also dynamic and strongly typed, so all three of them are, and it's an interpreted language. It's multi-paradigm. It has a functional core, which, as you might remember, uh, it was inspired by Scheme, partially, uh, but it also supports a procedural or object-oriented style. But, uh, I would say it's mostly a, a functional language. Okay, cool. So, um, again, continuing to look at these from a, a program perspective, um, there's a lot of similarities, as you said there. What do you sort of think of as their, like, their standout features as programming languages? What are the interesting things you can do? You mentioned multiple dispatch in Julia. What are the other sort of, what are the other sort of things in the languages? Yeah, so for Python, I think one of the standout features is uh, its syntax. So Python is, unlike many of the, the well-known languages, is white space sensitive. Mm -hmm. So this means that the number of spaces at the beginning of a line do matter. In, in many languages, they don't because they're just ignored and scoping is done via uh, in C-like languages with curly braces or maybe with parentheses and lisps. But with Python, white space is very important. So if you have a function definition, then the body of this function must be indented relatively to the def uh, indentation of the function definition. And um, this might take a little getting used to, but it is actually a, a very good feature of Python because the code will be structured in a visual way where you can see the scope. So um, in a c like language, again, uh, you have the curly braces and there's no guarantee that you put the curly braces on the right places. You can put things on the same line. But with Python, scoping is done via the white space, indentation rules of Python, and that makes it uh, very consistent. And you can see at a glance what the scopes are of things. And I 
Personally, I really like that. Mm -hmm. um, another aspect of Python syntax that I appreciate is that they have human readable keywords where they can. So um, in many languages doing a Boolean or is uh, two pipes, but in Python it's just the word OR, so OR. Uh, same goes with AND. And I, this might seem like it's a trivial thing, but I actually think that it, it makes for uh, easier reading because, well, we're used to reading the word AND and we're less used to reading the word word ampersand, ampersand. Um, another feature that really makes Python stand out is its expressiveness. And with that, I mean that you can do a lot with very little Python code. So um, there are a couple of things in the language that help you with that. For example, you have list comprehensions and they are like a shorthand syntax for uh, generating lists. Um, mm -hmm. In many cases, you would uh, have a for loop, you iterate over the thing, you slowly build up an accumulator value, a list, but with for comprehension, you can do it in a very succinct way. And many for loops can be rewritten to list comprehensions. Not all, but many can. And they are actually a really nice uh, declarative way of uh, generating lists. Related to that are generators, which can also generate data, but they are different from list comprehension that they generate things lazily. So mm -hmm. uh, a generator is actually quite efficient because it doesn't have the burden of having to create the list. It will just generate things when you ask for them. So that's what the laziness uh, means. You only get the data when you ask for it. Mm -hmm. And this means that you can work with uh, infinite, infinite like data structures uh, because you only generate the next bit of data. And the last expressiveness feature in Python that I'd like to mention is decorators. And decorators are a way of writing functions that can wrap other functions. And that way you can influence the behavior. So you could have a logging decorator and you would uh, put that uh, with a little syntax on a function and you will automatically get logging functionality for your functions. Um, another standard feature of Python is its vast wealth of libraries that are available. Python is a very popular language and that brings with it a couple of benefits, including having many people writing Python code. So the number of resources slash libraries that you can use is uh, enormous. So there's probably all, always something that you uh, can use that was already written with somebody else. And uh, I highly recommend you trying to find the things first before you write them because there is such an amazing wealth of libraries available for Python that it's just stunning. Um, and finally, we mentioned this before, so I won't go into detail, but I think one of the standard features of Python is that you can use it for almost anything. So if you learn Python, you can then apply it to a wide variety of domains, which I think is an, an excellent feature for a language. So let's move on to the next language, Julia. So what Julia um, has uh, to me as its standard feature is multiple dispatch. So if you know what uh, method overloading is, uh, it is basically if you have uh, functions slash methods with the same name, but depending on the number of arguments or the types of arguments, uh, different uh, it, it will determine which function is being uh, called. So you might have a function um, foo with one argument of type int, and you might have a function foo with one argument of type float. And the type of the argument determines uh, which function to call. And with usually in object-oriented languages, uh, the first thing, which is the object, so the class basically determines which method is called. But in Julia, the types and the number of arguments uh, are all taken into account. And this is what's called multiple dispatch. And it might seem a bit weird, and it also might seem like not a big deal, but it actually is. And there is a really nice video that I um, linked to in my Julia introduction video. So uh, if you care about that, uh, do get that. But it will show you how multiple dispatch is incredibly powerful. Um, it's much more than just function overloading. It's, it's really, really cool. A, a second feature of Julia is um, that even though it is a dynamic language, so you get all the dynamic goodness where it's, uh, your, your read eval loop is, is very short and uh, it's easy and pleasant to write in, uh, but it still has great performance. So usually mm -hmm. it's a trade-off. You either do static, uh, a static language like a C or a C++ and you get great performance, or at least you can. You can, of course, write bad C code, but in general, you get good performance or you do an interpreted languages, and then uh, you get the, the benefits of all the dynamism of the language, 
but the downside of it having uh, less performance. Mm -hmm. But Julia is actually dynamic and performance. And um, it's actually amazing that they managed to um, write a programming language that is dynamic, but which performance can uh, at times rival that of Fortran or C mm -hmm. or C++. And that's just uh, amazing. Very um, impressive. Um, what I also like about that is that um, normal Julia code is often performance. So uh, if you look into uh, guidance of languages on how to write performance code, it will often have things like don't do this, uh, try loop unrolling, whatever. There might be very specific technical things that you need to do. But in Julia, basically, you have these things. But the normal uh, code is often performant enough for you uh, to not even bother with that. So mm -hmm. Julia actually recommends putting things in separate functions. Whereas in some languages, they recommend you putting everything in a single function to uh, avoid the function overhead, but Julia doesn't. Nice. So I quite like that about Julia. Um, a third standard feature is that Julia runs very, very well when uh, in distributed scenarios. So I mentioned the Celeste project, uh, which has uh, a huge number of machines running um, Julia. So uh, Julia is designed to be great at distributed computing, and it has several things that make a great for that. So you have uh, tasks, which are like coroutines, which are things that can be done and suspended, basically. And you mm -hmm. have channels that allow sort of like processes to communicate with each other in a safe way. Um, you have multi-process support uh, with message passing, which is great for high performance. And um, in general, Julia has a lot of features that make it really shine in a distributed computing scenario even though it isn't that complex to actually do it well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they really nailed that part. Yes. And then finally, uh, I mentioned this before, Julia was designed to take the best things of all these languages. And it means that um, it can be used for a ton of different things in the scientific domain. So uh, data mining, machine learning, linear algebra, Julia is all great for that. So it's uh, a very gener general language in that it allows you to do a lot of different things well. Nice. So that was Julia. Finally, R. Yeah. So R is also a very interesting language. Um, one of the standard features to me are its uh, flexible data types. So um, at its core, uh, most of the things in R are vectors or lists uh, or variations thereof. So a vector is a collection of things. Um, but the, the what many people th might find interesting is that uh, you usually have an integer or a Boolean, and that's just it. It's just one integer. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, use an integer in uh, R code, it's actually uh, secretly converted to a vector with just that integer value. So you don't just have loose integers or Booleans. You have vectors with one element in them. And, and this must, might seem silly, but uh, it isn't, because R is actually great when working with vectors. So one of the things that's great is that it has vectorized operations. So uh, consider the plus operator. If you have a, a vector with maybe a couple of integers and you do plus two, it will return a new vector with two added to each of the elements in the vector. Mm -hmm. Normally you would write a for loop or maybe something else, but in R uh, you can do that easily with vectorized operations and you can multiply a vector slash matrices, mm -hmm. um, R even has a data type that's called data frame, and that's a collection of vectors of the same length, and is actually designed to be perfect for uh, scientific results. So you have readings. So uh, it's probably you have the same uh, set of things that you are measuring over time. So the columns are the same, but you have many different records for the mm -hmm. different instances where you measure that data. And the data frame uh, is actually designed to be perfect for that use case, and you can uh, visualize it easily within the RStudio IDE, which leads me to the next standout feature. And that is that R is an integrated suite of software facilities for data manipulation, calculation, and graphical display. And mm. uh, what I mean by that is that you get everything that you need for exploring data, visualize, visualizing data, manipulating data, and you can all do it in an integrated IDE, which is called RStudio. And um, R Studio is perfect for doing data mining. You get uh, you have an environment which lists all the variables that you're working with. You get a REPL where you can dynamically 
uh, evaluate things, which by the way, Julia and uh, Python also have, they both have REPLs too. Um, they all have, but our studios ones is really uh, amazing. And uh, I would highly recommend you trying out our studio if you want to try R. I showcase it in my introduction to R video. So if you are keen to looking into what that might look like, uh, check out that video. Um, and the third and final standard feature that I'd like to mention is that the R community is really great. Um, there are a lot of people in the R community, but it is still a very friendly and diverse community, which is not always a given on the internet. So the R for data science online learning community, uh, it's, it's a mouthful, uh, <laughs> is a community of R learners that are basically trying to help each other. So if you have questions, you can post them there. Um, they have a mentor model where you can apply to be uh, mentored by somebody else. And they have an open Slack group where you can join and ask questions and get uh, friendly uh, advice from others. And uh, having a, a friendly community around the language is one of the, the better things that you can have because it really makes for a pleasant experience when you want to integrate in the language and want to ask questions about um, why something works uh, differently. And R is a different language, so that might actually be very useful. For sure, that's really cool. If you um, if you're watching, uh, if you haven't yet watched the videos that Eric's made on those three languages, and you're interested in learning more about all of them or any of them, I do recommend um, looking at those videos. We'll be releasing them probably at the same time as this this video. Um, but Eric's recorded as he's doing with lots of the tracks at the moment. Walk threes of the languages, talking more about what he's just said, but also doing some coding in those languages as well, so you can get a bit more of a um, a feel for the for the different languages and see some actual code being written in them. So, um, Eric, if, if people are, um, they've heard all that and they're still unsure of uh, which languages they should should try this month, how would you recommend them choosing? Who should who should try which if, if you don't have a preference after listening to what you just said? I would say that like everything in IT, it depends, um, <laughs> but that's a bit of a cop-out. Um, I'd say it mostly depends on your goals and your personal experience, of course. Okay. So um, if you're new to programming, um, I would recommend Python. If you are interested in doing AI or machine learning, you can do Python or Julia, but Python is probably your uh, safer bet. Um, and if you want to learn a language that can do a lot of different things, I would definitely recommend starting with Python. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a couple of reasons why I think Python is great for these uh, goals. So one of them is that the number of resources available for Python is, uh, is great. So you have uh, free online courses on Python from established uh, universities like uh, Harvard and Microsoft has a couple, Google has some. So there's a lot of things that you can learn about Python online for free that is of high quality. Uh, and in general, there are just tons of tutorials and, and blog posts, etc. So it's great if you're starting with a language, especially if you're new to programming, that there are so many resources available to you. And for AI or machine learning, well, Python is the de facto standard there. So um, anytime you want to do AI or machine learning, you're likely getting into uh, some Python code at some point, or at least using things that are written in Python. So um, if you are interested in that domain, I would highly recommend trying out Python because it's such, uh, such a key part of the whole AI machine learning domain. Um, Python can be used for a great many purposes, as we mentioned. So if you want to as I mentioned, learn something that can do a lot of different things. Python is an excellent choice. And um, another reason why you might want to try Python is because uh, you mentioned this before, is that we have the Python tech has learning mode enabled. So you have exercises to help you learn the basics of the Python. So um, I highly recommend you trying that out because it's really well made and I had a ton of fun doing that myself. So uh, it's a great way to get started with uh, Python. Um, then if you are interested in doing statistical work or you want to explore and visualize data, or if you're curious about a new way of working with data, I would recommend R. Um, R's data types are based on collections, as I mentioned, like vectors and lists. Uh, and the fact that you can uh, work with uh, vectors and lists as if they were regular scalar values uh, mm -hmm. is very, very cool. and. Uh, it opens up a, a lot of opportunities for um, trying out things in a different way. Uh, you're probably not used to working with vectorized operations, 
unless you maybe come from um, one of the several languages that have that. Uh, but most major languages don't have that. So it's a different way of uh, thinking about your code. And I, I really think that it's a, a very good reason to learn a new language because it helps you think differently and it will make you a better programmer by doing that. Um, R Studio is also a selling point of R because it is uh, when you want to explore or visualize data, um, it is a perfect environment for doing that because you have everything inside a single IDE. You have plotting capabilities, you have a REPL, you have the environment that is being shown. So R Studio is great if you have uh, use for uh, visualizing and exploring data. Um, well, of course, if you want to do statistical analysis, R is great because it was built for that. Um, but if you want to do plotting of data, that's also uh, a, a key thing that R is good at. So if you have data that you want to visualize in a graphical way uh, with nice uh, bar plots or scatter plots or whatever, um, R has you covered. And then finally, if you are interested in scientific computing in general, so a lot of the different aspects of it, uh, if you want to run code concurrently, if you really care about performance or you want to learn a modern elegant language that offers something different from most other languages, you could uh, you could choose Julia. Um, for one, multiple dispatch, as I explained, is one of its standard features and is really different than what you do in other languages. Uh, and it's incredibly powerful. And I had a lot of fun exploring the different ways in which you can use multiple dispatch. So if you want to learn something new, Again, um, Julia is also great for doing that because multiple dispatch is at Julia's core. Julia is great for scientific computing because that's what it was designed to do. Uh, but it also has a type system that's really flexible and expressive and it feels very pleasant to use. So uh, Julia has um, a lot of features that make it a, a, a nice language to work with. So um, it doesn't get into your face. Uh, it allows you to do what you'd want to do uh, in a very seamless way. And basically mm -hmm. all three languages have that. But Julia is also great at that. What Julia uh, is best at for these three languages is its performance. So Julia has very good performance for a dynamic language, might even be the best for a dynamic language. And uh, if you care about that, Julia is an excellent choice. And maybe you wanna write some benchmarks, see how your Julia code performs to mm -hmm. your C code or your Fortran code, whatever you prefer. Um, have a check and see if the Julia uh, compiler is as fast as you think, uh, as they say it is. But <laughs> uh, Julia in general has excellent performance. And if it wouldn't, they wouldn't have used it for supercomputers analyzing mm -hmm. 1.78 terabytes of data. And then finally, um, with the uh, previous point, it also showcased that Julia is excellent for concurrent execution. So if you want to run code in parallel and have it be very efficient, um, then Julia is an excellent choice. Um, but of course, if you have the time, I would recommend you trying out all three languages because they each have something uh, going for that. They actually have multiple things going for them and they are different enough that you can uh, learn new things from every single language. So if you have the time, uh, try all three of them. And if not, maybe uh, the, the tips I just gave you are helpful and let me know if uh, which language you, ch you chose and uh, how it went. So um, I'm really curious in what people uh, think of these languages. Yeah, it's really, um, it's worth trying the five different exercises that we've, um, that we listed at the start, if you can, in those three languages, and look at how you can solve the same problem in those three different ways. Um, and I, I think that'll be a really, especially because, you know, they are, as you said, Eric, all, all uh, dyna you know, all dynamic languages, they're all similar. I think it's really interesting to see how the differences then shine through um, in those ways. So thank you so much, Eric. Um, that was great. Um, this takes us to the to the end of our analytical April uh, introduction. I hope you have a, a really great month. Um, we'd love to see you on Discord. There's also the forum as well. Um, we're going to try and get some interviews and things throughout this month. So there's going to be lots going on. Um, please do have fun, uh, get involved. And if you're finding 12 and 23 fun, you're finding Xism useful, please also consider donating to us because we survive by, by your donations. Um, and if you've donated already, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, see you uh, in the Discord. Thanks.